Yeah, yeah, excited to be in church, everybody. Hey, I forgot to mention, if you're new or if it's your first time here at Vertical Church, as always, we have a, a, a green tent outside with a gift for you. Make sure you don't leave without your gift. We always love to bless everybody who comes to visit us at Vertical Church. Also, we have connection cards in the seat back pockets right in front of you uh, that you can fill out. Let us know it's your first time or you're new and you've never done that before. Please fill one out and take it to the green tent afterwards. If you're online, you could text Vertical Life to the number 94,000 to let us know it's your first time. You can fill out a virtual connection card. All right, come on, give somebody an elbow, say this is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. All right. I was laughing. uh, (laughs) By the way, I hope everybody had a good Christmas Eve and Christmas Day yesterday. I know for many, plans were a little different than maybe uh, you originally had planned because people not feeling well and all kinds of things, but I hope you guys were okay. Uh, I was laughing. One of my pastor friends told, uh, told us a story that their little kid, their little uh, son, I mean, he might be like two or three, told, told the mom, you know, I don't believe in Santa Claus. I don't believe Santa Claus is the one who brings all the gifts. And the mom was like, well, why don't you believe it? And he goes, it's Amazon is the one who brings all the gifts. <laughs> so... The kids are figuring things, <laughs> figuring things out. Um, I, I've been praying that, uh, that the Holy Spirit would speak to your hearts today. And, um, and I hope you're, you're kind of you're coming in a receptive posture. I remember growing up, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. Um, and, and sometimes you'd go to practice or to game, like really excited, ready to play. And other times you weren't, like you, were, you weren't even stretched out and, and warmed up. So if you came today to church and you're not stretched out and warmed up, I'm praying right now that the Holy Spirit would stretch you out and warm you up and, and be receptive and expectant to receive uh, whatever the Lord has for you. Um, I, wanna, I wanna preach a message entitled, The Dividing Line. The Dividing Line. I want you to picture a line kind of divides before and after. I want to talk about the dividing line. Um, I want to talk about a few dividing lines that happen in our lives. And I want to do it from the perspective of a passage in Matthew chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles uh, or, or your devices, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read a passage from there. Uh, the truth is it's kind of an interesting portion of the Bible in regards to the birth of Jesus. Um, we realize that the Son of God was born in the midst of really complicated circumstances. Um, if, if you don't know the story, let me just refresh a little bit. Uh, there's this evil king, Herod, who he felt his power was being threatened, and so he attempted to sabotage Jesus' birth. Uh, he began to kill babies in order to attempt to prevent the arrival of Jesus. The, the issue of Babies being innocent victims isn't something new today. It's always happened. Um, He was trying to prevent the arrival of Jesus, and all the baby boys under two years old were at risk of being killed in that time. Uh, And in the middle of all that chaos, God sent a sign. He sent a sign. Uh, and, And I'd like to talk about that sign today. I believe that he continues to send us that sign of what he came to do but, but also it's a representation of what he wants to do in each one of us. Uh, and my prayer today is that, that we would have a personal encounter with God, a personal encounter with Jesus today. Whether, whether you've known about Jesus ever since you were a little kid or whether this whole church thing is kind of new to you, or whether you feel you're super close or super far from God, I believe there's something that he wants to do in you and, and for you today. So can we just pray? Can we pray? We know that a seed is only as good as the soil in which it is planted, so I want to pray for the soil of our hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would allow our hearts to be receptive, to be fertile soil, ready to receive the good seed of your word, and I pray that those seeds would grow and flourish and give much fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Matthew chapter two, starting in verse one. And it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, some magi from the the east came to Jerusalem. By the way, magi is another way of saying these wise men or these wise kings from from the east, from, from far lands, came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose 
and we have come to worship him. Pause. What did they see? The star. What did they come to do? Worship. Okay. I want you to remember, hold on to this. So what did they see? The star. And what did they come to do? To worship. Verse 3. When King Herod, when he heard this, he, they're, they're talking about this king of the Jews that was born. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written in, in Micah 5 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, these wise men, these wise kings from far from a distant land, and he called them secretly, and he, he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared to them. Because now, remember, remember that King Herod was very insecure. He was worried about his power, and now who's this, who's this king of the Jews that's being born? And hey, Magi, tell me more about this, right? And then it says in verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, hey, guys, go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, Report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Pause. Do you think that King Herod was going to go worship that baby? No, because he was actually killing babies, trying to avoid this. Verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Let's just stop right there. So the star they had seen when it rose, it went ahead of them, and they followed it, and it stopped where? Right over the place where Jesus was. So my goal today is not to study the scientific implications of this miracle, because this was a miracle. I mean, the fact that the star led them there. I want to study the symbolism of this miracle for our lives, when God encountered the lives of these wise men that came from, from the east, from far land, and, and when he encounters our lives now, it's, it's as if time stops and everything changes. One of the reasons I believe the birth, I believe in the birth of Jesus Christ is because of how he's changed my life. Um, in other words, in other words, the reason I believe in Jesus Christ is not so much, oh, because the Bible says here, because this is what scientific. The reason I believe in the birth of Jesus is because Jesus has changed my life personally. Somebody follow me? So, so for me, more than an argument, it's a personal experience. Does that make sense? Which, which by the way, uh, a man with an experience will always trump a man with an argument. A person with an experience will always trump a person with an argument. Okay, so, so my position as I speak of Jesus is not because, well, scientifically, it's because, man, he's changed my life, right? And the birth of Jesus in this obscure place called Bethlehem, in a time where there had been silence from heaven, became, listen to me, the dividing line. This became the dividing line in all of history. That's what this star in Matthew 2, represents. We can look at our calendar today and say that all of time is divided by this one event. You ever heard of BC and AD? Why is it 2021? Why is it about to be 2022? In relation to this. Many people remember where they were when a major event happened, right? When, when you hear like, oh, like you hear some people from certain generation, oh, when so, so whatever president was assassinated, oh, some of us might be, be like, I remember where I was when 9-11 happened or when whatever decision was made in the court or whatever thing happened, right? Some of us in 20 or 30 years, if Jesus hasn't come back, are gonna be like, hey, I remember when COVID happened in 2020 and 2020, right? And so a lot of times there are moments and dates that mark history, but none of them have split time in two. None of them have been this dividing line, like boom, before and after. In this message, I want to challenge you to think about the birth of Jesus in a personal way. Because it's one thing to believe in the birth of Christ historically, but I want to talk about the birth of Christ personally. Okay? What, what does it mean in your life? And the best way to do that is to compare it. You, you know, maybe, maybe, through the biggest defining moments in our lives, 
right, or momentous occasions in our lives, some things happen with such a force in our lives that they mark a clear, like if this is a line, there's a clear before and after, right? So I'm going to give a few examples to kind of lighten, lighten up a little bit and to, and to kind of get you to understand what I'm talking about, um, especially for those who are a little bit older. So, so um, the greatest human decision I made, aside, aside or after from accepting Jesus, was the decision to marry Ghislaine, my wife, right? This was a single greatest human decision that I've made. It literally divided my life in before and after. Can I get an amen? There is a, all right, let's use it up on the screens. There's a BM and an AM. Okay? Anybody married in the house? Anybody married in the house? All right. There's a BM before marriage and there's an AM after marriage. Can I get an amen from some married people? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. (laughs) Single people, this is what you have to look forward to. There's a dividing line, BM and AM. So before marriage, she was hoping for Prince Charming to sweep her off her feet, feet, right? After marriage, she's looking forward to Mr. Clean come home and help clean the house. (laughs) BM, AM. BM, the, the guys, husbands, BM, the couch was a place where she'd let you cuddle with her. AM, the couch is where you sleep when you've been bad. BM, BM, men don't understand their wife. AM, they still don't understand their wife. Some things don't change. Thank you. Marriage is different. Marriage is different. You got to share everything, uh, your life, your bank account. You talk about everything. You can't just go and do, you can't just do and get. You. It's, 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 it's a dividing line. PM and AM. It's a dividing line. Your life is one way before, your life is one way after. Um, but that's not even close to how your life changes when you have kids. Let's put it up. Let's put up BK and AK. All right? Any parents in the house? Yeah. All right. BK and AK. BK, before kids, it's dinner in peace and quiet. Anybody remember that? Back, back in the BK? Yeah. AK, it's peas and carrots flying, it's high chairs, it's bibs, and then eventually it's, I want this. Things change, the dividing line. There's a change. BK, you wake up on Saturday, ready to watch the game or ready to go to the park or do whatever you're gonna do. It's just it's just the just the two of us, right? AK, you wake up on Saturday when your kids wake you up to watch five episodes of Dora the Explorer and three episodes of Curious George and a YouTube of Sesame Street. That's what my kids watch anyway. I don't, I don't know. Things have changed, I'm sure. BK, AK, BK. BK, here's the conversation, BK. Like as, as spouses, it's like, hey honey, have you heard of the new sushi restaurant at South Beach? AK, AK. I mean, did you hear the new Chick-fil-A around the corner that has a playground? It's a dividing line. Now, we all have different dividing lines in our lives, right? For me, for me, one was becoming a pastor. I'm going to put mine. This one, you might not share this one, right? BP, BP, and AP. Before pastor and after pastor. You guys can help me out on projection. There it is. BP and AP. So before I became a pastor, I had certain ideas in my head about what it meant to be a pastor, what it took to be a pastor. Before BP, I had this image of being, you know, a shepherd feeding the nice little sheep who are so obedient and submissive. And then AP, after becoming a pastor, I realized it's not easy because sheep are stubborn and they bite your hand trying to feed them. BP, I thought I'd, I'd be content with the amount of people that I saw at church when I got in there. AP, after becoming a pastor, I realized how many people truly need Jesus out there and I'm not content with what I'm seeing. And I'm saying, Lord, prepare the next building so we can reach even more people and greater amounts of people. BP, before I became a pastor, the Bible was primarily a book I thought of as a book of information for my head to become more knowledgeable. AP, after pastor, I realized that people go through so many crazy things in their lives 
that if you're really going to minister God's word to them, it can't be just something to feed their minds intellectually. It has to be something that helps their hearts and their souls in their daily lives, in their relationships, in their families, and in their interpersonal relationships, in their marriages, in their workplaces. And it's so much more. Now, now the mind and the, and the, the information is important, but, but it's not nearly complete if we're not reaching the hearts. BP, AP. So everything changed. And, and you know what's been burdening me a little bit this Christmas is that, is that we would all consider these things and really relate to them clearly. Um, of course, everything changes when you get married. The two become one. If you didn't know that before you got into it, then I don't know what you were thinking, right? Of course, everything changes when you have kids. And if you don't know that, then you're not ready for kids. Or if not, get ready. Of course, everything changes when you have a certain position or responsibility. In my case, a pastor, I took a responsibility. I took an oath and a vow before the Lord. Now, now here's... Here's a question that I have. Why is it, and I, and, I, and I ask this with sincerity of heart, why is it that so many people have this, this vague sense of allegiance to God? Why is it that so many people have this light sense of relationship with God, this, this light, vague sense of belief in God that has not yet become in their lives this dividing line? that marks their life into before Christ and after Christ in my life? Why is it that so many people can treat Christ so casually when the scripture so clearly says that I am a new creation in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come? Why is it? Why is it so hard? To always see that clarity, boom, there's a dividing line, that's a clear before. No, it's a process. It's a journey for all of us, but why, why is it that sometimes the line is so blurry? Why is it sometimes that, that it's, like, it's like nothing's changed? I'm still doing the same thing with the same people, going, you know, like, like there's nothing that's significantly changed because there hasn't been a clear dividing line that says, this was me before and this is me after because everything had to change when that dividing line happened. And yet so many of us sometimes wish, well, I still want to hold on to this, and I still want to hold on to this, and I still want to hold on to that, and I still want to hold on to her, and I still want to hold on to this thing. And it's almost as if I see the star, but, but I'm not ready to bow. How can... So many people take so lightly the thing that supposedly split time in two. History of the world into B.C. and A.D. When the star stopped over the place where Jesus was born, it was a sign to that ancient world that this day, with this birth, everything changes and nothing is the same. And if that was a sign that God sent with the star in scripture, why would it be any different in our lives and experience today? Why would so many of us think that we can have this on again, off again, sometimes kind of maybe, yeah, I'm Christian, amen, hallelujah, not so much today, I'm feeling it, I'm not feeling it, I'm up, I'm down, why? Ah, kind of, yeah, kind of, no. It depends on how I'm feeling. depends on the mood. If it's convenient, then praise God. If not, then ah. Why, why is it that it's so easy to fall into that in the world that we live in when Jesus said, I have commanded you, I came to command you to take up your cross and follow me. And, and you got to leave the world behind. And if, you don't, and if you love the world, you can't love me. Pastor, calm down. I'm just, I'm just preaching my heart. I'm confused about this gospel that is sometimes being preached these days that, that really doesn't draw a line. Ah, just keep on doing it. Just, just be a good person. You're so good. Like, I'm confused about this. Like, when you ask the question, hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, man, my mom raised me. No, I'm not talking about your mom. It's almost like a telltale sign of somebody who, who doesn't really have a true... Are you a Christian? Well, you know, my mom took me to church ever since I was... No, no, no. I'm, 
hey, it's, your mom's great, your mom, but I'm not, I'm not asking about your mama. I'm asking about you. Hey, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Oh, you know, my wife, she doesn't miss a Sunday. Hey, hey, great for your wife. But I'm talking about, I'm asking about you. How is your relationship with God? So I believe that the birth of Christ is so important that it's not this little side note. It is the thing. There should be a line in your life. There should be a a clear dividing line in your life where you say, that is where I met Christ. That is where the star stood still. And not only did I see it, I went to where I gave my life in worship to Jesus. There should be a point, a dividing line in all of our lives that says that is when, that's when it happened for me. Yeah, I went to church as a kid with my mama. Yeah, my wife, you know, church. Yeah, my friend. Yeah, my husband. Yeah, this and that. Yeah, yeah. But for me, for me, it was then. It was there. It was, boom, it became real to me. Boom. It didn't happen all in one moment, but there was a clear before and after. There's a dividing line. What I feel, what I feel we have in a lot of churches today is people who have seen the star but have not bowed their knee to give their life completely to Jesus. That's, that's what I think we're dealing with. And I know that because I had to make my own decision at some point. And I'm a pastor's kid. Oh, PK. Yeah, I'm a pastor's kid. And all the time... I get invited sometimes to speak to pastor's kids throughout the years, even in different countries and different events. And, and the, here's the thing. <laughs> I get to minister to young people who were raised in church, and they know all the stories. They know all the stories. In fact, they can even tell you where to find it in the Bible. They've seen the star. They know, they know it. Can I, can I give you a point here? Here's a point if you're taking notes. Seeing the star doesn't save you. The question, the question isn't, do you go to church? Oh, yeah, I go to, I've been going to church for years. You go to church. You can see the star, but that doesn't save you. The message of Christmas is not just that Jesus came and, and everything's all right. No, the message of Christmas is that Jesus has come and all who trust in him and all who believe on him and place their faith in him completely and entirely and forsake their way, former ways and embrace a new life they're thus born again, are, can be saved. And so here's, here's the question I want to ask. I want to ask you, if I could t- take time to ask it individually and online as well, here's the question. Have you crossed the dividing line? Have you crossed the line? The question is, is not, do you go to church regularly? The question is not, does your grandmama go to church with you? The question is not, are you, a, are you, wait, you're a good person, aren't you? The question is not, have you done, if you heap up, heap up all the good up in a mountain that you've done and you heap up all the bad and the bad is less than the good, then you're good. That's not the question. The question is, have you crossed the line? The dividing line, the decisive line. The marker that says, this was me before Jesus was the king of my life personally. And this is me after crossing the line and making Jesus the king of my life. So here's the question. Have you crossed the dividing line? Now, depending on where your heart is and how you feel about me maybe, you can either hear what I'm asking you as an accusation or as an invitation. Right? So those of you who know me, you know me. You know that there's love for Pastor Verge because you know you. Because I love you and I care about you. If you don't know me, I want to just tell you, God didn't bring you here to condemn you. The Bible says he didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but he sent Jesus to save the world through him. You want to know what condemns? Let me tell you what condemns. What condemns is something known as the law. Everybody say the law. So before Jesus came into the picture... 
humanity was under the covenant of the law. When Jesus comes into the picture, dividing lines, the law now transitions into the covenant of grace. Okay? So what are they? The law and grace. So the law was there. Jesus comes in. He comes and he brings in grace and truth. When Christ came, everything changed. Boom, dividing line. When he comes into a life today, everything changes too. And maybe God brought you to Vertical Church today or brought you to, you know, verticalchurchonline.com or however you got here right now or a Vertical Church app. Maybe the Lord brought here today, not just to check off a box and say, check, I went to church on December 26th. Yay, good for me. Maybe he brought you here so that you could cross over from spiritual death (laughs) to spiritual life, from darkness to light, from sin to righteousness, from hopelessness to a hope that can lead you to where he wants to take you. Have you crossed over the line? Have you had a clear encounter with Christ where where you not only saw the star, but you bowed your heart. I believe that, I believe that the Lord brings messages like these to many of us because sometimes we've been flirting with the line for a long time. We've been flirting in and around the line. Some, some hey, I don't know if it's you, some are really good at tightrope walking that line. You're all about that line. You could one leg that line. You could hula hoop that line, but you just haven't crossed it. And that's, I think that's the biggest danger is people that we've convinced ourselves that we crossed it, but we're still over here because that's called self-deception. Oh, yeah, 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 but, but I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still living over here. I think a lot of times... We have a good intention. We say, I'm going to put Jesus first, but then we just start putting everything else where we want to put out. And Jesus doesn't want to just be up. He he wants to be in the center of everything in our lives. You know, our normal response as human beings to a message like this is maybe to feel a little bit guilty or ashamed for the things we're not doing that we should be doing or the things that we are doing that we shouldn't be doing. And I just want to bring it back to the main question. Speaking of the dividing line, have you crossed over the line? And I'm sure that someone is thinking, you know, it's true. I have to get my life in order. I have to get right with God. And then you start making a list in your mind. It's the end of the year. It's a new year coming up. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. And, and maybe the list is growing even as I'm talking right now. But when you fall into that mentality, you're doing the same thing that everybody did before Jesus came under the covenant of the law. Okay, Pastor Virgil, explain that. All right. Before Jesus came... That's how the law functioned. Here's the law. You have to do this. You have to do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do this, and you'll be good with God. Sacrifice a lamb for this. Sacrifice a goat. If you have this many people, a dove. Okay? Sacrifice every year on these dates, and then your sin will be atoned for and forgiven. And between God and men, between God and people, were these men or these people known as priests. And through that priest, you can get right with God. Keep the law, you'll get to God. Do the right things, you'll be justified. Do the wrong things, you'll be condemned. That's how things were in the covenant of law, dividing line, before Jesus. Here's the problem. Religion... Jesus came, there's already, a, there's already a grace covenant, but religion still does the old things today. That's what religion tries to do. And that's why many people, even who've been in church for a long time, all my life, I grew up in church, yeah. You can be in church all your life and not know Jesus. I think this is the reason why a lot of people haven't crossed the line. Because, because you think that crossing the line is something that you have to do. Now listen to this. Here's a good point. Crossing over, when we're talking about crossing over the line, is not about something you need to do. You cross over because of what he's already done. Can I, can I say that again? I think somebody needs me to repeat that. Crossing over 
is not about something that you got to do that you need to do to prove it or it's you cross over because of what he's already done. So the manger, the manger that Jesus was placed in when he was born, the manger where animals used to eat, that manger is significant because it pointed to the cross. Because the manger is also where they would put new baby lambs when they were born. And then it was later said of Jesus, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How did he take away the sin of the world? By going to the cross to pay for our sins, shedding his blood. So what the star announced in Matthew 2, the cross accomplished in Luke 23. And by the way, it's one of the saddest and most beautiful paragraphs in all of scripture when you read Luke 23. If the star... If that star stopped to announce, so check this out. (laughs) Remember Matthew 2? The wise men, the magi from far, they were following what? The star. If that star stopped to shine brightly to announce the birth of Christ in Matthew 2, the universe conspired to announce his death in Luke 23. How did it do that? Well, I want you to see this, okay? Luke 23, verse 44. Speaking of when Jesus was on the cross, kind of coming to the end, it says, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. Pause. The the sun stopped what? What? Shining, and it says that darkness came over the whole land. Now, we talked about the star shining and standing still when Jesus was born, and I think it's significant that the sun (laughs) refused to shine when he died because the light of the world was hung, seemingly defeated by darkness, and it was as if heaven brought the natural course of events to a halt, and then the sun stopped shining. And then it goes on to say in verse 45, the second half of Luke 23, and the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two, which is a symbolism that there is no longer anything impeding us to have a personal relationship with God because of what Christ did. So we cross the dividing line from the law of now being in the grace. We cross the dividing law that Jesus marked of BC before Christ and after after Jesus. So everything, Jesus changed everything. And when he was born, the star shone brightly. And when he died, the sun stopped shining as an evidence. The veil was torn. And you and I today no longer have anything impeding us. We don't need a priest to sacrifice for us. We don't need somebody to step before us. We have direct access to our heavenly father because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. And the cross became the bridge. So if you want to cross the line, you have the bridge because Jesus laid the bridge down with the cross and you and I can cross over from before my life before Christ, the old me to the new me in Christ. It's a whole different ballgame. It's a dividing line. It's not like, oh, it's Christmas. I got to go to church. It's Christmas. It's not about that. It's not about, oh, one day I'm going to be a good person today. It's not about being a good person on a day. It's about choosing a life. Here's something for your notes. Not only was he born to call me to cross the dividing line, but he died to cross the dividing line on my behalf. The message of Christmas is that the cross is the dividing line. I believe, I believe that most of you have probably seen the star and maybe heard a Christmas message like this or others. I believe that a lot of you have done good things. But I'm not talking about good things, bad things. I'm not talking about good people, bad people. I'm talking about the cross where Jesus hung and died. I'm talking about forgiveness of your sins. I'm talking about the condition of your heart. I'm not talking about, does your grandma go to church? How many times have you gone to church? What what if God stopped the star over your life 
today. Maybe it's been a crazy year. And if he stopped for these wise magi kings from the east so that they could come to a place where Christ was and worship him, could it be possible that he created this moment for you today? (laughs) Out of all these people that he sees, God sees and knows your sin and my sin. He sees and knows my past and your past. He knows and sees your future and my future. In fact, he's done everything possible to secure it for us. And all he requires us to do is believe. So think about this. What other God not only commands his people to cross over, but then in love and mercy and infinite grace bridges the divide for them and says, all you have to do is believe. Believe. You don't have to do something to prove it. You don't have to pray a certain amount of hours and do so many good things and and make a list of them and then believe. Every other religion would say, well, start this, do this, do that, stop this, don't do that. And the scripture says that if you will believe, if you believe that Christ died and rose again, you will trust him with all your heart and declare that he is Lord. It's not about you have to stop this and you have to do that because he who began a good work in you will complete it. He who started this whole thing knows how to carry it all the way down. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He knows what you didn't do. He knows what nobody else knows. He knows the peace that, that you, you know, the, the peace, the things that you, you know about yourself that nobody else knows, that you wish you hadn't. He knows the disappointments that you've been through and you face. He knows the challenges that are ahead that you haven't faced yet, but he shouted a message from the cross, and the message is this. On the cross, he said, it's finished. It is finished. It's done. I've completed it. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to help me. You don't have to do a certain amount to then be worthy because it's impossible. Our good works, Isaiah says, are filthy rags before the Lord. So it's it's nothing we could do. It's what he did. So what the star started, the cross finished. What the star started, the cross finished. The search is over. Your sin can be over. Your shame can be over. And I want especially young people to hear me, teenagers, young people, young adults, please hear me. You don't have to waste the next three decades of your life trying to find happiness in some random thing or in some sexual escapade or in in the high that a substance can provide for you. You don't have to waste years of your life searching for the wrong things in the wrong places that will never help, that will only leave you emptier, that will only leave you less satisfied. You don't have to waste years of your life trying to find acceptance and approval from people who are just as confused as you are. The search stops here. The search can stop right now for you. It's not, oh, when I get my act together someday. No, no, no. (laughs) No. It's today. The, The Bible says the very moment that you believe, the the worst of all sinners and the best of all saints, all stand in need of the same grace from Jesus at the cross. So, so here's the question. Have you crossed the dividing line? Do you know that your relationship with Jesus is in right standing because of what he did? Not because of what you think you are worthy of. Do you know? There's a dividing line. It's clear. There's no hesitancy about it. There's no gray about it. There's no blur about it. It's very clear. 
the Bible calls this, this step, this crossing of the dividing line, the Bible calls it being born again. Have you ever heard that phrase? Being born again. Because, because when it happens, everything changes. Because when a baby's born, everything changes. When a life is born again, things change. There's a clear line. There's a before and there's an after. And it changes not just so you can see the star, but so you can bow your knee and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I want to pray two prayers as we finish. I want to just pray a prayer over all of us that would that would help us truly consider where we are. And I think for some, you just need a little bit of courage. Some, you need a little bit of faith. Some, you just need some people to rally around you and encourage you. But in the end, we each have to make the decision for ourselves. So I want to pray for you. And then, and then after that, the second prayer is going to be more of an invitation where I want, I want to invite people that maybe, maybe you feel far from God and you want to draw close. Maybe you feel like you've been flirting with a line your whole life <laughs> or for a couple of years. And maybe today's the day for you to cross that dividing line. Amen? So let's pray this first prayer. Just, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, I pray. I pray for so many friends that are here, brothers and sisters in Christ that are here and that are watching online. I just pray right now that, that we would hear from this message what you want us to hear. I pray that you would help us to see spiritually what you would have us see i pray lord that lord that we would not be satisfied with just seeing the star but that we would want to follow up with actually bending our knees bowing to worship jesus i pray lord that you would remove from our paths any obstacles any relationships any things that might impede our progress towards you. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring great conviction that there is clearly a dividing line that Jesus marked with his birth in this world and it affects all of humanity, including each and every one of us. So we thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.